I got a fucking bone to pick with you right now. Is it about the thing that's behind the Armander right now? We we are now on this, the Lord's 73rd episode of the Duels and Mandalore's podcast. I'm Connor. And I'm Sam. And we're the Dungeon Bros. We are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. And I have never felt more insulted at this table than I do right now. Mm. You see, I'm a big purveyor of the AL8 zero sugar variety because mm-hmm. I'm a fat boy. I'm a fat boy, and I want to suck down like 10 of these, sure. if I could, Why given not? the opportunity. It's a Kentucky classic. It's a staple. Another staple in this household, the Diet Coke. Mm-hmm. Big fan of the Diet Coke here. You've even begun to drink some of the Diet Coke occasionally with yes. the caffeine-free. Yes. So what the fuck is that? Well, that's the taste of a new generation. Not sponsored. It's Pepsi. It is Pepsi. For the non-video viewers, that was a Pepsi that he just held up. Diet and- caffeine-free Pepsi. Ooh. We're already indulging in a melancholic lifestyle between the diet and the zero sugar varieties of these sodas. So I don't know why we need to go from melancholy to just straight up depression with caffeine free. Um, yep, it keeps me up at night. I'm caffeine sensitive. Yeah, I, I, I get that. But it's 11 a.m. Mm-hmm. You could totally be having caffeine right now. I could. I already had a pot of coffee this morning before nine. Well, 9.30. I have a friend that has uh, has a heart condition. I'll tell, I'll tell you his name because we both know him. Um, he has a heart condition that he found out recently, and he, like, can't have caffeine at all now. Mm-hmm. He's going through, like, major withdrawals. Oof. It's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. Yeah. Oh. Why, why is the screen? Oh, because I'm highlighting things. <laughs> the screen flashed at us. It terrified me. Anyway, we got a lot to talk about. We just got back from Gen Con like a week ago. Yes. A week and a half ago. Something like that. I don't fucking... Time's time's a weird soup. Time's a weird soup. Time's not real. No, no. We engaged in some playing of games, mm-hmm. some walking of the show floor, some gathering of magic. So eating out of food trucks? Oh, yeah. Oh, I was, also, eating, I was eating food from the food trucks. I don't know what you were doing to the food trucks. Let's just let's just be let's be clear. This year, I feel like the food truck quality was way up. Oh my god, absolutely, infinitely better, infinitely better food trucks than in previous years. Um, portions, you know, food truck portions. They're food truck portions yeah. still, and I'm a large boy. Yes, but we don't we don't eat every meal at the food truck. Thank God. No, <laughs> thank God. We're not we're not just swimming in cash. No, 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 no. no, no. I'm all, we already spend way too much at these conventions. Oh, yeah. So I mean, leading up to the convention, we spend a lot. Then at the yeah. convention, we spend a lot. But we return generic tickets for system credit. <laughs> I just didn't buy any this year. <laughs> Man, so one of, one of the big, in my mind, disappointments, just because it was a lot of money on the last day, we didn't know about it until like mm. it was basically too late, was uh, Gavin Verhey's unknown event. That happened. It was like seventy something dollars, and it ended up being this commander draft, and a lot of people got Mister Booster too. Yeah, which is really fucking cool. We didn't get to partake in that. Um, it was to be. It was. It was on the again. It was last day, and it was like noon to four, mm-hmm. and we were tired by nine a.m. on Sunday. Yeah, yeah. I had a little bit more in me. I ended up. I ended up walking around and getting like some signatures and mm-hmm. like cleaning up some loose ends of things I wanted to buy and all that stuff. Sure, but that's different than completing it than the yeah. you know, doing a whole activity, yeah. you know, a whole draft and into a game of magic. I think it would. It, I, it's something to keep in mind. It, though, absolutely. For future conventions, it's like always do the Gavin Verhey event. Mm-hmm. Always do the Gavin Verhey event because it's it's gonna be a good time. Uh, my Gen Con started a day early. Yeah. On Wednesday, I ended up driving back. Up and back, because <laughs> we didn't get an Airbnb. There and back again. There and back again, a hobbit's tale. Um, Wizards of the Coast invited me out for uh, for a D&D preview event for the Player's Handbook, which was really cool. I uh, saw a bunch of random creators there. I, I made a joke at the Dungeon Dude's extent, uh, expense, Good. for instance. Okay. They were over at the table. There was a, ta- a table with like a bunch of third-party things, and the company that printed Dungeons & Drakenheim mm-hmm. was there, and they were talking to them, and they were like flipping through their own book, and I'm like, man, whoever made that must have been like really weird or something, right? And then one of them like turned to me, and he's like, okay, I see what you're doing. <laughs> I'm like, ah, okay, I'll leave you alone. <laughs> Uh, but I met some cool people there. Um, True Strike Podcast, a a D and D podcast where they talk about D and D, and they aren't just actual plays. They they were there. We respect that. We respect that. They're about our size, actually. Uh, I tried to You're DM what, six four, and I'm about five eleven. 
literally they were in in that way mirrors of us. <laughs> <laughs> one of them one of them looked a lot like one of the dudes from Nerdarchy if they were like twenty years younger. Hmm. Uh, like the bigger the bigger guy with the white beard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like age him down twenty years. 20, 30 years, something like that. And that would be one of the guys. And then the other guy was just kind of like, oh, man. I mean, there's no way they would watch this. I, he just kind of looked like a dude. <laughs> just kind of looked like a, a bit of a dude, you know, a if, dude guy. Uh, True but, Strike Podcast, if you're listening to this right now, uh, yeah, come at us. Yeah, come at us. I DM'd them on, on TikTok, um, but they don't follow us, so they they didn't see our DM. No. So, you know, well, I tried to be like, hey, it was nice meeting you guys, but, you know, it's whatever. Yeah, well. Um but we got some really cool things from the yeah. D&D event, courtesy of Wizards of the Coast. These were provided for us for free. For I should, free. I should mention. Uh, the big one is, of course, the Punchins and Flagons. It's the it's the cocktail book. Uh, it's got a lot of cool stuff. They were serving mocktail versions of some of these, uh, which was really cool. Uh, we also got, like, the Player's Handbook. Um, and then we got, like, some sunglasses and notes and stuff. Yes. Got a bag. Oh, the bag. the bag. Oh, the bag. The bag was great. The t-shirt I'm wearing. Really yeah. cool. Uh, but yeah, we have an early copy of the 2024 Dungeons & Dragons Player's Handbook. Yeah. Signed by Jeremy Crawford and Chris Perkins. And he did, me, he did a little a little mod run little, little a thing. A little doob. Yeah, so this comes out in a month. Yeah. Um, they were You were able to buy these at Gen Con. Uh, you had to sign up for an event and they would... They were limiting to, it to like 250 tickets or like 700 tickets for yeah. the weekend, something like that. And you could get up really, really early in the morning and try and get one of those tickets, which would let you buy one of the player's handbooks. Uh, but this one was provided, and it's got like the cool D&D 50th, and it is a chunk-tastic book. Yeah. This is bigger than like any other D&D book they've really printed. <laughs> In a lot of ways, and this is just the size of the player's handbook, and also the size of the DMG, and also the size of the monster manual. So we're in for a lot of cool stuff. Um, we could go into a full dive on this right now. We're not, because it's a lot. <laughs> it is a lot of book. Uh, we're gonna give some stats rundown here in a little while. Um, but yeah, if you want a full review. Go over to our Patreon. Join for free. Patreon.com slash Dungeon Bros. You can join for free or pay $5 a month. Or get early ad-free access to the podcast. All that kind of stuff. Um, and you can just let us know there. There's comment threads and stuff mm-hmm. all the time. Um, I also don't really want to do like a full deep dive thing until it's closer to the actual release when people can get their hands on the book. Yeah. Uh, there are plenty of creators out there who have already put out their... Uh every detail about this book and my thoughts on it and it's like i don't have a time to watch a yeah. two and a half hour video right now literally um there was one creator uh there's a bit of controversy i don't know it very well i don't i don't even remember his name but people probably know it's there's this guy who's a youtuber and he got an early copy of the player's handbook mm-hmm. um earlier than we got um and he was talking with wizards about doing like a flip through video of the book where he just kind of flips through the book Mm -hmm. to show a lot of the stuff and they had some guidelines for him and he ascribed to those guidelines and then when he posted the video they copyright struck it Mm. which i don't know if you know this about youtube uh there's the claims on videos where you basically it's like oh the video stays up but then the the organization that's claiming copyright content just basically profits off your video yeah which in and of itself is not always a great thing because it's like, oh, I included a five second clip of this thing in my 25 minute long thing and now I'm not getting any money from it in this company. It's it's a flawed system. But the copyright strike system is like the company putting the hammer down, the video's not up, and your account is flagged effectively. If you get three copyright strikes, it is permanently deleted. Just straight up. No recourse. Yeah. So a little bit weird. Just want to put that out there. I got you, you. Another reason I don't really want to do right <laughs> like an early review thing. You gotta imagine that's the uh, one. Another one of the continuous breakdowns in the what Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro uh, infrastructure, where one person said yes, and another person who had nothing to do with that said no. Yeah, I, and to be fair, a lot of those YouTube systems are like automated strike systems also that, too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the player's handbook's really fucking cool. We've had a chance to look through it a little bit. Um. Yeah, yeah. We'll get into some stats here in a little bit, but we also have Mystery Boosters Two to talk about. Yes, and the festival in a box. 
uh, a D&D 50th anniversary secret lair as well, which uh-huh. actually looks really fucking cool. The cards look cool. Value? Dubious at best. Dubious. Dubious at best. Uh, I also oh, I put these away. Damn. Vamp. Okay. Uh, uh, vamping. Okay, you here we go. Va- you, you didn't va- okay, I got the Monty Python secret lair in foil. I also got it in non-foil, and, and the girlfriend is a big Monty Python fan, and you gave her like a nice little frame. Yeah, a little card frame. frame and- yeah, we framed up nine of the cards, and I think two of them... There's two that she couldn't include. I believe the Merit Lage token, just because it looked really different, and the uh, Birds of Paradise, which is the African mm. and European swallows on each side, because it's a double-sided card. Yes. So that one got a hard sleeve, so you can see both sides of it, and then the token is just because it looks decidedly different in formatting True. and color than the rest of the cards, so it just didn't fit quite as well. Uh, but yeah, big fan of that. <laughs> Pretty cool. <laughs> not monetary value of the uh, cheapest value of the cards not there at all not even no. kind, not even kind of there but it's monty python so i'm an addict sometimes you just gotta buy the buy the buy the cards because of the art not necessarily because of the you gotta go for vibe vibe yeah you gotta go for the vibe not necessarily the value yeah if you were looking to resell these yes obviously well just again we, we were discussing this a little bit before and we'll talk about it a little more with the dungeons and dragons for the secret layer mm-hmm. The monetary value of secret layers higher. Of the the individual yeah. cards are often sold for more because there are less of them. Yeah, it's it's a weird like self inflation system in a bit of a way, but you know, beggars and choosers and all that. Anyway, let's do a proper rundown of the yes. Patreon. Patreon.com slash the Dungeon Bros. If you join, you can join for free. free. For free. Uh, if you join for free, you get access to the feed. You get to see comment threads, question threads for the podcast where we post uh, the Friday before we record. And you can submit questions for the show, which we have one. And uh, you can vote on polls for like videos and podcast guests, all that kind of stuff. If you pay $5 a month, though, you get early ad-free access to the podcast the day after we record on Wednesdays. If you don't, that's fine. You get the ad-ridden variety, courtesy of the Proxy Forge. <laughs> <laughs> on uh, free feeds the following Monday, and then uh, there's a higher tier if you want your name read mm-hmm. at the end of the show. We might eventually add another tier here because there's changes afoot in the dungeon home mm-hmm. where Monday Night Magic's going to be going over to a spell table system. Yeah. Uh, so we might do like some Patreon guests for like a proper four player commander night of monday night magic which would be very fun uh but yeah sam and i are moving yes and we're not moving to the same place neither nope moving to separate places two different places two different places you're heading back up to basically where you come from very close yeah north of cincinnati in ohio and i'm staying in northern kentucky just a different city yes in northern kentucky and a lot of things are going to be remote now like the next episode of the podcast is going to be remote yeah you'll just see You'll see uh, us. In, individual portraits of our faces. Indeed, indeed. We've got the proper things. We have the microphones. We'll be able to do it. The podcast will relatively be unchanged. Yeah. In many regards, if anything, it'll be more comfortable for us, <laughs> so we don't have to sit at this angle and like mug to the camera sometimes. So you know, changes afoot, end of an era, mm-hmm. and all that. But people don't give a shit about that. What have you been playing, Sam? Oh, what have I been playing? Um, I've been. I'll start. Go ahead. You think. I have been playing, wait for it, old school RuneScape. You know, the sure. hit PC MMORPG from 2003. Yeah. RuneScape. Heard of it. So I don't know if you know this about RuneScape. It was introduced, it was reminded of to me uh, by our friend Lincoln over the, the Gen Con weekend. And I was mm-hmm. like, oh my God, that's right. Because RuneScape went through like a whole lot of updates as time went on. And they introduced a lot of microtransactions and a lot of problems into runescape Mm. and there was an outcry from the community around 2013 of we really really don't like this can we get a version of it that's reset back to like original runescape uh and they found a build from 2007 and then they have that they also have the modern runescape 3 which is their regular MMORPG with more reasonable microtransactions and it's much better quality, more modern. But then they developed old school RuneScape and they just kind of like have added back in all of the features yeah. and have just kind of continued to go on the path in the old school way. You can get the app on your phone. You can download it for free and play it on your PC. I'm doing both. 
it's a very fun time. There you it's go. It's very nostalgic. I ended up loading up my old account because I did play old school RuneScape on my phone for a couple of months in like 2019. Mm. Um, just as something to do in my downtime at work. And, <laughs> and it was fun and I played for like a month and then I moved on and we're like a week in and I'm like, oh, wood cutting now. <laughs> wood cutting? Oh, yeah. Sure. Got that. Got to get that wood cutting skill up. I never played RuneScape. Really? Yes. Did you play any MMORPGs again? I did not. Man, it took over my life in middle school, dude. Come home, sit at that computer, do the Fist of Guthix minigame sure. quite a bit. Skilling out the mining to get into the mining guild. You know, it was a whole. that's where they had the best ores. Sure, that makes sense. <laughs> Little, I'm 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 in the fucking deep end, man. <laughs> I'm way in the deep end. It's, shit is so similar and yet so different at the same time. It's crazy. I was gonna say I have walked past your computer and seen what you know, like your YouTube pages, <laughs> and now it's like, oh, <laughs> like I'm used to walking past your computer and seeing you know your YouTube filled with with uh, Kingdom Hearts content, yeah. D&D, and magic. Yeah. And then I was like, I had to take a moment and look and be like, what? What the fuck is that? O-S-R-S? What? Yep. What? Easy F2P guide for 99 woodcutting? What is that? <laughs> <laughs> RuneScape has, like, been going forever. And it is still played, and the company is still viable to exist in 2024 for a game that was created in 2003. Yeah. So, like, props to them, but we're in the rabbit hole right now. I imagine the hyperfixation will die off in a couple of weeks, but, you know, it might just be a casual thing. It's it's a nice game, because it's one of those, like, click point-and-click MMORPGs. Mm-hmm. It's just very, you just, like, click, and then it takes a while to do the thing. Sure. And it's very easy to pop it up on my left monitor, and it's like I got a video, or like I'm I'm like typing something or whatever, and I just swing the mouse over, click, and then I move back, and I'm doing my thing, mm-hmm. and I'm like, oh, I gotta keep fishing, oh, <laughs> oh, gotta keep chopping that tree, you know. Anyway, <laughs> what are you playing? <laughs> uh, I picked back up Bioshock Infinite. So about a year and a half ago, I uh really got in uh got the hankering to do some achievement hunting, mm-hmm. and but the bio the first, the Bioshock series is actually very good for it. Um, oh, yeah. It's got some challenging stuff, but a lot of completion stuff. Uh, and I did one and two, and I was like, "Hold on, I know I have infinite. Like, I know I've I've purchased all of these at some time, mm-hmm. and I just couldn't. I spent like four hours, not four hours, like fourteen minutes looking on the. <laughs> Those are two very different time frames, my guy. (laughs) Hyperbole. But I I spent more time than probably necessarily like trying to find why I couldn't find it on the PS5 uh, or on the store, on the PS store. Don't know. It's back on there now. Oh. And so I re downloaded it and I've been going through that trying to get some achievements. That's fun. That's fun. I'm waiting for, right now, I'm currently waiting on DLC for Persona 3 Reload where they do like the final episode, like Mm. epilogue story thing. Uh, from Persona 3 Fests back in the day. Uh, so I'm excited for that. And that's kind of all I got on the docket in terms of games I'm looking forward to right now. I've got, well, I've got... Oh, a Final Fantasy VII Rebirth eventually, but I'm kind of waiting for that to just pop up on um, uh, PlayStation Plus. Gotcha. See, I've got the Alan Wake DLC that I haven't played yet from mm-hmm. Alan Wake 2. Very good game. Control 2, they just announced that Control 2, same universe, same developer, obviously... Uh, is now in a playable state. Oh. Yeah, so that's exciting. And then uh, Risk of Rain 2, which is one of my favorite games, mm. uh, my favorite roguelikes, is coming out with a new DLC. Yeah. Are you still on the Bellatro oh, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, and Slay the Spire grind? Uh, I think Bellatro has taken over Slay the Spire for mm. me for right now. It's kind but... of like a casual like, sit-down vibe thing. Yeah. Very much. That's fair. Uh, I also would be remiss not to mention the Harry Potter Quidditch game. Which I believe is going to release on PlayStation Plus as oh, well. Cool. So, kind of like how they did with Rocket League. Oh yeah, when yeah, it came out. It was on PlayStation Plus. I think it's going to be cool. I was a little kid. I love playing Quidditch World Cup on like the PlayStation Two and the Game Boy. Oh back yeah, in the day. <laughs> those were great games. Anyway, this is not a video game podcast. This is, of course, the Duels and Mana Dorks podcast, where we talk about D and D and Magic: The Gathering. You can get it on podcast services. Around the globe, Apple, Google, Spotify. The Google Podcasts, I think, is changing their shit, so that yes. might go away. I think Google Podcasts are like a foobar at this point. But they were on Google Podcasts, but they're on Apple, Spotify, YouTube Music, podcast services around the globe. Mm-hmm. Um, we also have the RSS feed on the Patreon, if you so desire. 
uh, where you can put that into whatever your podcast service of choice is and you get it directly in your favorite app. Yeah. Which is pretty cool. Pretty cool. I have set that up on my phone so that I get our own mm-hmm. notifications when we post twice. <laughs> one for the regular and one for the Patreon feed. It's it's something. You can also follow us on Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, X, whatever. All that stuff. TikTok. TikTok. We have 40, people, people still follow us on there. We haven't posted a video in a while no people still like our videos people still comment on the videos people still follow us from the videos we also do monday night magic live streams Mm -hmm. which we talked about earlier they're gonna change it's gonna be webcam spell table i'm gonna try and get that working on tiktok the tiktok live studio as we've talked about in the past not the best software system in no. the world at one point we tried to use it and it yeah. was more like shooting ourselves in the foot than anything yeah the quality of the stream went way down and even when even before the quality went down uh the viewership went from like oh we would we would start the live and it'd be like it would balloon up to like 200 at first and then settle into like 20 30 40 yeah ish range um on tiktok live studio it would balloon up to seven and then settle it like one. Yeah. <laughs> Which was him. <laughs> on the his monitor. monitor. Yeah. So yeah, that's it. That's it. But anyway. Before we get back to the rest of this episode of the Duels and Manadorks podcast, we'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, ProxyForge. ProxyForge creates high quality Magic the Gathering proxies for you to use in your commander decks and really anywhere you want. You can get custom Magic the Gathering packs that include CEDH staples as well as monocolor commander staples, cycles of expensive cards like Tutors and the Swords. You can also get upgrade packs for Commander Precons that include 10 cards to soup up your favorite Precon. If all you want is a very simple mana base, you can get any of the cycles of lands as well as lands organized by color pairing. And that's not to say anything about the custom art soul rings you can acquire as well as the plethora of singles available to you. Use the link in the description below to help us out and check out Proxy Forge to help bling out your board state. We, all, we, always, uh, we always go over the upcoming releases in D&D and Magic the Gathering, and there's some new additions now. Yes. So, Samuel, what are the upcoming releases? First up with D&D. Uh, if you are a very special boy, you've you've maybe already gotten the first one, the Player's Handbook. Uh, full release, Ooh. of course, will be on September 17th. In about a month. In about a month. Or you can look at your character origins right now. <laughs> Zoom in. <laughs> Enhance. There you go. Uh... uh following that we'll have the next uh, the uh, dungeon masters guide that will come out on november 12th and next year on february 18th we will have the monster manual that will be coming out uh those all also have uh D beyond releases about a week or two f- uh, prior yeah and if you are if you're on D beyond and you still subscribe or you're on the fence uh there's gonna be a lot more D beyond integration with this next edition there will D&D. be uh, moving on to Magic the Gathering. Starting with Bloomboro, it's out. Right now. Right now. Immediately. It's, it, it's, you can go to Walmart. <laughs> go to Walmart, go to your local game store. You can draft it now. Target. Target, yes. Don't buy the value pack. <laughs> no. Do not. I, re- I repeat, do not buy the value pack. I saw a short today. I don't know the creator. It was on It was on YouTube short, so I was just like, oh, that's neat, and I scrolled away. The value pack seven cards. Yes. If they did a no rares value pack for like a dollar, two dollars, that was eight cards, it would then be draftable. That's true. And you could do like a popper style draft and the draft would be way, it would be focused, or I guess it would be, what would that be? Penny? Uh, uh, Penny draft? No. Oh, what's the uncommon? Peasant. Peasant draft. Like a peasant style draft. You get uncommons and commons. You'd be able to draft around a table of that three packs, six dollar investment, three, four, five dollar invest, something like that. Very reasonable. Even ten dollars if you want to be a little bit outlandish with it. Yeah. A nice draft environment where it's not going to be focused around. Oh, I pulled this bomb. It's mm-hmm. like who's going to soundly construct their deck around the core mechanics of the set. Yeah. So kind of like a different vibe on the draft. That could have been a cool product, but they didn't do that. No. Anyway. Yeah. So <laughs> if you want. The, 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 that, that value booster was supposed to be to give people uh, an opportunity to f- have fulfill the full magic experience without putting in so much money. Don't. No, you can't draft with it. You can't draft with it. There's no rares. There's no it, it's, cool things. It's even more gambly because, yeah, there is a small, there's a small chance of a rare. A small chance of a mythic. Also. Not worth it. Not worth it. 
also, it's five dollars. Yeah, the price that a regular pack should be. Anyway, moving on. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to hound wrong. on that forever. It's so stupid. Don't get us wrong. We love Bloomboro. We don't like Bloomboro's the pack design. Next up. Regular pack's great. Really? Value pack. Absolutely. Value pack design. Next up um, is going to be Mystery Booster 2 Festival in a Box. Yes. This will be... Uh, this is for Magic on Las Vegas. Yes, specifically. We'll get into the details of that in a little while. Because yes. it's pretty cool. Oh, yeah. You can get it only on the Secret Lair website on August 19th. Yep, so August 19th. Hope you uh hope you got the money for that in a week. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to something more available. Uh it will be Duskmorn, House of Horrors, the final, you know, uh, uh, arc set, the final story set of this year. Uh that will be that is planned to be debuted at PAX West and spoiler season will begin August 31st. Uh the pre-release will begin September 20th and the full release will be September 27th. Mm-hmm. Neat looking set. It is very cool. I like the aesthetic, but at the same time, I'm not a horror person. Yeah. I mostly like the the TV. Frames. Oh yeah. I think that's really cool. I think the mechanics, the mechanics we've oh, seen, yeah. we've seen, we uh, to it last not last episode. We on the podcast we talked about some of the preview cards we've already seen. Mm. They look very cool. Oh yeah. Uh, going on, we have the mystery booster two. The actual physical thing that you can buy at Magic on Las Vegas on October 25th through the 27th. Yeah. Uh, if you go on the 27th and expect to buy a box. Don't. Good, good luck. <laughs> go on the first day. <laughs> That's when you'll be able to actually buy the convention booster boxes. Mm-hmm. And finally, the final release, the finally announced release for this year will be Foundations, uh, Magic Foundations. That will be released on November 15th of this year. Yeah. The somewhat non-rotating standard set. Minimum five years in standard. The foundation of standard. If you were to make a set called Magic the Gathering. That would be it. That would be it. Mm-hmm. Hypothetically. All right, moving on. All right. We got the main chunk today. We're going to dive in a little bit deeper into the Dungeons & Dragons event that I went to on Wednesday, uh, the Wednesday before Gen Con. Got some nice statistics for the Player's Handbook as the well book. as... As well as the D&D uh, DMG mm-hmm. and the D&D MM, a.k.a. Monster, Monster Manuel. Manuel. And the most interesting part, Project Sigil, which is the 3D virtual tabletop they've been designing in Unreal Engine. We got to see a lot of stuff there. Stuff that they haven't posted online yet. So very exciting. And we're going to dig way into Mystery Boosters 2, the festival in a box, all of that. Because it is fucking cool oh yeah and you're probably not going to be able to play with it (laughs) anyway suck it nerds suck it nerds (laughs) that's so mean that's us too (laughs) yeah i know (laughs) all right the player's handbook 2024 edition 384 pages yeah this the dmg and the monster manual are all that size 384 pages. Uh, a lot of this stuff we've talked about on previous podcasts as well. There are 48 subclasses, specifically exactly four subclasses for every single class. Mm-hmm. Your beloved necromancy wizard is is not present. No, no. Never beloved. I, I had to rewrite the necromancer. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Available on uh, Drive-Thru RPG. Oh, yeah. We do have that on Drive-Thru RPG. It's pay what you want. I check it every so often. We have like 10 bucks in there. And you're like, okay, yeah. cool. Sweet. <laughs> uh, there are 75 feats in this book. Note that because of how they changed the feat system, it includes specifically uh, origin feats, which are like the background features you get. General, like generic feats, which are just kind of like the regular feats you would expect to get. Fighting styles are all feats. Yep. So you get to take a fighting style feat. I think that's just to save printing space on uh, classes and subclasses that would give you fighting styles. Uh, and then the epic boons as well, which I believe there are about 10 of them in yeah. this book. Uh, all of them, all of the general feats, the generic feats. General feats. All of the generic feats give you a plus one bonus to one of a couple stats. So I reviled the change to like the sharpshooter feat where mm-hmm. they removed the minus five penalty to attack to get plus 10 on damage. Uh, sharpshooter, still pretty all right. Great weapon master, still pretty all right. Great weapon master, you still get the bonus action. Yeah. Or pole arm, you still get the bonus, like that kind of stuff. But these feats are now giving you a plus one stat boost 
to a stat of your choice effectively. So a lot of the power floor of these feeds, because we were seeing just the features in the playtest, yeah. are being brought way up, which is very nice. Yeah. 375 spells, all of them have been, a lot of them have been rewritten. Um, weapon mastery system, the rules glossary, which is probably one of my favorite parts of the book, honestly. Mm -hmm. Just having all of the rules in one place that you yeah. can reference very easily and not have to like flip through. Uh, crafting rules for basic crafting and no artificer. There is no artificer, but uh, there was a QA and a section. We got to ask questions. And one of the questions was asking about the artificer. Uh, they did not give any information about the artificer at all, but yeah. this is a quote I wrote down from Jeremy Crawford. Quote, there is more artificer tastiness on its way. End quote. Delicious. Artificer. So, yes. Hopefully, I'm, again, I, I, I hope that that artificer tastiness is basically an overhaul of the class. Oh, absolutely. It's going to, I imagine it'll be very different. Yeah. I would hope. It was never that great. Yeah. So the majority of the book, largely the same. Terminology has changed. Some of the rules specifics have changed. Uh, they noted the backwards compatibility of the book specifically. Uh, if you have a subclass you really love that isn't in the PHP, you can just use that subclass. Yeah. If there's a revised version, excuse me, no. even if it's under, even if it's under a different name, for example, uh, the Illusionist Wizard, mm -hmm. no longer the School of Illusion, thank God. <laughs> Uh, that is effectively the new version of the previous School of Illusion subclass for the wizard. And so if you are playing with the 2024 rules, you are expected to use the new version of the subclass. Same goes for uh, various spells like True Strike, for example. Yeah. Uh, they want everyone to be playing with the same version of spells. So if you are playing, let's say, a School of Necromancy wizard for example, or a blade singer wizard. Sure. A more popular subclass. Yes. I would say. And you wanted to take the true strike spell. You would still have to use the new version of true strike. You would not be able to use the old version, though. I don't know why you would. I was going to say, I don't know <laughs> why you would want to. Don't know why you would. Uh, but you are still able to use old spells that don't have a printing of it, like silvery barbs, for example. Mm -hmm. You can still take silvery barbs. And that applies for all of the classes and subclasses across the board. We've had a chance to flip through it a little bit. Yeah. What are some of the things that you've really, that's really stuck out to you? I've really enjoyed how they have reorganized the book. Mm -hmm. um, like the spell lists, for example, are now very much more sensible. Yes. To and look at. And attached to the classes. Yes. <laughs> and not in the back Thank by God. spells. <laughs> Uh, but the organization in general, like you said, the rules glossary is a big one. The crafting systems. A lot of uh, rules have been brought over from the Dungeon Master's Guide. Mm -hmm. You know, the rules that the player would need to know. Yes. Are in the player's in their handbook. handbook. <laughs> Which is very nice. Yes. Um, most of that information is stuff that we've known about for a while already uh the same kind of goes for the stuff that we they did talk about the dmg and the monster manual we knew about the bastion rules we knew about the greyhawk setting the dmg is going to have a poster of greyhawk on one side it's the continent on one side it's the city of greyhawk itself uh we knew about the sample adventures they have like campaign crafting guidelines and suggestions and those sample adventures are going to use those specific guidelines in the new format mm -hmm. and it's not necessarily reflective of how their campaign books going forward are going to be formatted and look as well uh interestingly we're going to be getting uh a lore glossary yeah they they specifically called out like the um the influx of people from people from shows like Critical Role, Dimension 20, from uh, Stranger Things, stuff like that. People are coming into D&D that don't necessarily understand what a Beholder is or mm -hmm. don't understand like the, the existence of the inner and outer planes and how that all kind of works together. And so all of that kind of lore, including an entire chapter on the cosmology of D&D, yeah. &D, which is Unique. so fucking nerdy. <laughs> Uh, all of that is going to be included in the Dungeon Master's Guide as a reference for people. Uh, they're also going to have tracking sheets and maps uh, you can use for NPCs, locations, uh, magic items that you're kind of making up on the fly. Uh, an entire chapter on treasure. <laughs> Love it. An entire chapter, a big chapter on treasure. Uh, new and easier system for magic item crafting, which 
part of me wonders why that isn't in the player's handbook, but I imagine that's just because a lot of the magic items are in the DMG. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, and they have all of the DM guidelines and how to play as a DM in the first chapter, right out of the gate. Yeah, that was a that was definitely a big thing they've talked about in videos previously, and uh, and all and it's that a lot of people just don't read the DMG. No, and not at all. and. To be fair, it's a reference book that's very dry. Um, but they definitely, they were like, we definitely want people to have a place that they can go and start. Mm-hmm. Um, because there is there is a lot of, uh, a lot of the times you'll see people online talk about, oh yeah, I've never read the DMG, but I'm the DM. It's like, okay, cool. Um, uh, then you hear their backstory of like, oh, I had this problem, this problem, this problem. It's like, all right, now that, but... A lot of these problems could be solved. Yes. But the DMG doesn't make it easy to solve them. But so hopefully now we'll be able to, uh, hey, here's here's your hit your ground. Here's the hit the ground running read me text. Yes. Yes. The TLDR, if you will. Yes. To use modern internet terms. Readme.txt. That was a good, that was a good one. I never read those. <laughs> they're, I mean, to be fair, they're developers as I, I i am a work in development and i don't either yeah i mean that's fair uh the monster manual is the last book that they talked about they specified numbers 500 monsters over 500 monsters uh apex monsters for many more creature categories so like the pinnacle of what that mm-hmm. monster can be like tarasque level stuff so that's exciting for high level campaigns um They've also expanded those monster families. We talked about the vampire yes. uh, family where they're going to have many more CRs of types of vampires, like one that's just been bitten and is starting to transition into being a vampire to a spawn to like a lower level. Va- and it kind of goes up and up and up. And then a higher level one as like the apex or like the the apex like hag mm-hmm. for witches and fae and that kind of stuff. Uh, we also have more NPCs as well as variations for NPCs, so you don't just have like here's the here's the archer. You're gonna have like an archer and a ranger and like things that are going to have similar aspects but be different. You're gonna have like several different types of spell casters, so mm-hmm. you can distinguish between like a um, an evoker and an illusionist and a necromancer and that kind of stuff. Uh, stat blocks. We've already talked about some of the revisions they've made to the stat blocks, reorganizing them with the actions all together, bonus actions, reactions. The weird thing they're doing with the with the stats themselves. Yeah, the very Excel spreadsheet. Yeah. You can see a lot of that in the player's handbook as well, because they still have several monsters and creatures and relevant, like, stat blocks for summon spells mm-hmm. and, like, and, uh, like uh, Wild Shade. Yes, thank and... you. Polymorph. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of the time, you're going to have the column for checks and saves, and those are going to be the same fucking numbers. So a lot of repeating numbers in those stat blocks, which seems like a choice, but whatever uh it's easier to read and that information is more readily available because a lot of people would look and they'd see oh saving throws dex plus 12 and it's like their dexterity is plus eight it's like they're getting proficiency in that uh but then wisdom plus three but there's no wisdom in the saving throw so people just wouldn't add anything yeah i imagine that's why they're doing it probably yeah but i mean and again it's one of those things like the the experienced person running the game versus yeah the uh the player who just got a a friendly npc at that running something yeah. like that and then then the probably the the part that was most exciting to people there at the time and if you're excited about the entire chapter in the dmg about treasure uh there's also a massive uh part of every monster and monster family of treasure suggestions Mm -hmm. for when you slay the monster and what you can get from loot and all of that um monster manual mostly done by chris perkins and the dmg was kind of like a collaboration with chris perkins and jeremy crawford jeremy crawford mostly with the php that kind of stuff so those are the main books yeah a lot of information we already knew again it's very it's a very uh, they've been very open and they've been play testing with us for the past two years mm-hmm. um and we have as as content creators have very much dived into every one of them mm-hmm. uh i will say that i did find it funny when when you you were telling me about it that night and you're like i think you asked uh what was what their thoughts on the new president were yes i did so we had it there was the q a section at the end i asked two questions one of them was about the new president john height 
And one of them, they didn't answer. Because, I mean, they had, like, a submission digital thing, and people were submitting a ton of mm-hmm. questions. And some of them are really goofy, obviously. Sure. Um, one of them was making fun. I was like, hey, Jeremy, why do you hate the cleric? Because the cleric's less powerful now. Yeah. And he was like, I love the cleric. My husband's a pastor. Like, I love the cleric. And then it was like, but <laughs> it was really strong. <laughs> uh, so it was like a whole balancing thing. It was a funny bit. But ask them about the president. And they were all like, we haven't had a chance to meet him yet. But we're very excited to get to it. Just very, like, canned yeah. answer. But interestingly, he they said that uh, this week, so the week following Gen Con was the week that he was starting um, at Wizards of the Coast. And they were going to have, like, a lunch with him after Gen Con or something to try to kind of get together. Yeah. Uh, they did call out, though, that they appreciate that he has played D&D and... I mean, they said they're happy with it. Obviously, they probably wouldn't be able to say otherwise. But, yeah. You know. But uh, that just goes on. And uh, I believe you said when you when that question came up, a lot of people, there was murmurs of, there's a new president. <laughs> yeah, people did. There was a lot of murmuring. And they're like, oh, yeah, for those of you that don't know, uh, we have a new president at Wizards of the Coast. And I was like, yeah, I know better than a lot of you. Yeah, but it just goes to, sh- it, it goes to show that um, I think we, we sometimes take for granted how much of the community has is going to be surprised by this because mm-hmm. they're not obsessing over it. They're not uh, they're not hanging by their their fingernails, clawing at. They're like, oh, sometimes you need information for a podcast, yeah. right? <laughs> Somebody's gonna walk into Target on September seventeenth and go, huh? Why does a player's handbook look different? Yeah, <laughs> literally, literally. Oh, did they put a new cover on that? That's crazy. Pick it up. Why is it, it feels heavier? It's, is this bigger? I think it's. Yeah, I mean, the the level of investment in the news Mm -hmm. for these things is just all over the place. But what I found interesting, uh, there was there was this woman who was like an actual reporter for like a website that was there. And I was like chatting with her. She didn't even know. Oh, so I was like, score. (laughs) Let's go. Uh, But to me, the most interesting part of the event was they brought on... uh, with the lead developer and like the, I want to say he's the president of the game studio. I'm not sure. Uh, to talk about Project Sigil, which mm-hmm. is the virtual tabletop that they've been developing in Unreal Engine, the 3D virtual tabletop to play D and D as well as design and create your own maps Map. in D and D. So, the first thing they showed is that they had Baldur's Gate three miniatures. <laughs> of course. So you're going to be they're going. They talked a little bit in the question and answer section, but they didn't really commit to it. Of they have ideas for like a marketplace integration with D and D Beyond for digital miniatures, digital dice, that kind of stuff. Uh, but they wouldn't really give much details on it. The things they did show, they showed a lot of video clips of designing maps. Mm -hmm. And their creative mode, it's kind of like creative mode Minecraft in a lot of ways, but it's way more detailed than that. You get like a Sims kind of perspective on the map, all 3D, and you can do something as simple as a click and drag Mm -hmm. to create a section, and then when you release, it'll auto-populate a room of walls, and you can go in and you can add set dressing, and you can add doorways and windows and all that kind of stuff. You can select a design, drag and drop, so it's like stone dungeon, and then it'll be stone, or like a a wooden house, and then it's like house with plaster walls and that kind of stuff to auto-generate quickly. You can do that on the fly during games as well. You know, you design a dungeon and they bust through a wall that you're not expecting. You can click and drag and you can open up a doorway between two rooms that didn't exist there already. And they can walk through or they they're like, what's behind this wall? And it's like, I mean, it would make sense for a secret room to be there. You can just click and drag and then you have a room right there that they can walk into. Um, You can also very granularly draw place individual wall sections floor sections you can do height adjustments you can do set dressing lighting all of this stuff built into unreal engine 3 uh very fucking cool my inner minecraft nerd is like (laughs) uh, i think that's going to be the most interesting aspect of the game is the map designing Mm -hmm. aspect of it and there's going to be i feel like a micro economy of people that are able to design and create these virtual tabletop maps and then use that for like patreon and sell them or sell them on the marketplace but we don't really know because they haven't talked about that yet. right uh one of the biggest things uh we know that it's going to be on pc console 
and mobile platforms. Yeah. Uh, they didn't specify which console platforms. I imagine PlayStation definitely. Uh, it would be easy to get an Xbox port if you're doing PlayStation Switch. I mean... I don't know. My, my only thought on that is... Minecraft is available on all of these systems, yeah. and honestly, like if you're if you're looking at the The Sims as well, the Sims, yeah. And if you're looking at the communities, it's going to be really ironic if this is not cross-platform. Oh, it has to be. <laughs> exactly, it has to be. But I mean, I think just for the access for everybody to be able, yeah, like uh, you were saying earlier, you probably want to do your if uh, if you're the DM, you probably want to do the designing on PC. That makes the mm-hmm. most sense. Maybe console. Yeah. But yeah, like you can't expect everyone to have access to a pc or or even a console these days but most people have access to their phones a lot of people have switches Mm -hmm. so i think yeah just being able to shotgun blast every platform possible absolutely is going to be in their best interest it's going to be necessary Mm -hmm. in a lot of ways um i imagine the mobile app that they're going to have for this is going to be a player client almost exclusively yeah like you're probably not going to be designing maps and setting things up as dm on your phone i mean you they might allow you to mm-hmm. <laughs> and give you that option, but I can't imagine people would be doing that. Um, but as a player, one thing they made a very definitive point to say was, if you are a player, you can download the app and you can play in another person's game that owns the game mm-hmm. without having to buy anything yourself. Uh, so much like in d d Beyond, how you can, as a DM, share one of your D&D Beyond purchases with yeah. one of your players, if you're a DM, that kind of system is going to be in place for the virtual tabletop as well. Yeah. So that right there opens wide the accessibility front on this. Uh, we, When they announced that this was happening, we talked excitedly about the possibilities yes. that were going yeah. on and making sure that not everyone at the table has to buy their own copy of it or have a D&D Beyond subscription. Um, just kind of makes it a lot more viable as a platform. Uh, They said it pairs very, very well with a D&D Beyond subscription. They also refused to give a clear answer on if it is a one-time payment, like you pay $70 for the game and you have it, Mm -hmm. or if it's a subscription model game where you can download the app for free. I imagine that's what it is, and they just didn't want to disclose that yet. They could also be like a hybrid thing where you pay $20 for the client, and then you can... You, you, there might be like a tier system in D and D Beyond. Get your battle pass. Ex- <laughs> get your battle pass. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised if D and D Beyond's uh, subscription model changed, and it's like the current D and D Beyond exists, and then there's a higher tier where you get access to maps and uh, tools within the virtual tabletop, mm-hmm. extra minis, extra like digital pieces for walls and set dressing and light, like all that kind of stuff as well as they're releasing it. Uh, like expanded library yeah. of, sor- of sorts, uh, but they didn't specify any of that. Um, that's kind of all the... Ooh, the other thing, the game systems of D&D. Every game system of 2024's edition of D&D is going to be able to be integrated into the virtual tabletop. So you could sit down at your computer, no pen, no paper, no character sheet, no dice, nothing, and be able to fully play D&D. You can also turn off any of those that you want. Yeah. So it'll link with D&D Beyond and you can have the window pop up that has your character sheet and you can click the attack button and it'll give you your attack roll and it can give you your damage if you hit. And it can do it and it'll show like a little slick animation. You can cast fireball and it'll show the fireball on the map and it'll do all the damage and do all the stuff for you. Uh, If you oh, I want to move my character, you can click and drag and you've got like the line and your walking speed and you can't go beyond that little thing. You also have the option to turn any of those systems off and do everything manually as mm-hmm. well, which I think is a huge, huge yeah. aspect of that. Being able to like ignore the generated die rolls and roll your own dice and being able to be like, ah, now it makes sense that you could climb up there and then just move the character up there. It, it really it really changes it from a video game to an, ex- an augmented reality version of mm-hmm. a tabletop. Absolutely. Uh, one person asked about uh, VR support, uh, and they talked a little bit about Tabletop Simulator as mm-hmm. well, because that's kind of a VR tabletop thing where it's very manual and you can yeah. play basically any game. Uh, they did not confirm any VR support, but that they were looking into it. I think VR support is kind of like a slam dunk idea, yeah, be pretty honestly. Cool. They, they did say one of their concerns was, was like, D&D, how long is a D&D session going to take? 
one of the things they're trying to do is make them shorter. Hmm. You know, we're integrating the die rolls. We're integrating a lot of these systems so that you can just play and not have to roll dice. Okay, that's 15. And then I have a plus three. So that's 18. Eliminating that so that just boom, boom. And then you can move on and try and speed up the, the pace of play. Um, but at the same time, D&D is still going to be a multi-hour game. Yeah. At the end of the day, and having a VR headset on <laughs> for that long. Yeah, I think they tell you to take breaks every like hour with VR yeah. headsets in particular. But I can I can totally see like a little uh, an integration later where you can put up your Oculus Rift or your PSVR or whatever, mm-hmm. and you can like turn it on and you can do combat in the VR and you can like look around the map and do all this stuff like get a, like a virtual first platform person. of it. Um, or go in first person That'd be cool. as your character, which would be fucking awesome. <laughs> uh, or be like, all right, turn off VR mode. And you take it off, and then it's just on the screen. Yeah, yeah. I imagine that would be possible, but they didn't confirm any of that. Sure. Uh, Project Sigil is probably my most ex- like the most exciting part of the new D&D for me. Mm-hmm. I think it's going to be fucking awesome. And as long as the pricing model is good... That'll be a big part of it, yeah. Yeah. Um, they did say you don't need a D&D Beyond subscription to use it, but you do need a D&D Beyond account. Sure. Which I think is fair. Ultimately. Fine. Yeah, that's fine. So an account is free. Yes. Yes. Um, next episode of the podcast, maybe, we'll probably do a little bit more of a dive into this. Let ourselves really dig into the, the new player's handbook a little bit. Uh, but I don't want to talk too much. I want to wait till we get a little closer to the official release when that information is more important to normal people. Yeah. <laughs> we're very normal. We got very lucky. <laughs> <laughs> you were um, you were ready to, to be up at like at seven AM to click that get ticket. I was I was like setting I was making the plans to set the alarms to like wake up five, ten minutes before the Gen Con, like you can get the tickets now thing and like get the ticket just to buy a player's handbook. And like a a week or two before Gen Con, I get a PR email like, hey, Connor, do you want to attend this thing? And I said, yes. <laughs> and when I got there, I was like, oh, this is like a whole to do. Because they had the, they also had the D&D cookbook that they're coming out with soon. And they had, they made a lot of like snacks and stuff mm-hmm. of the D&D cookbook. Uh, they gave us copies of the Pungent and Flagons cocktail book which is a hilarious name by the way it's good it's a good name they did mocktails of a couple of them one of them was bad (laughs) (laughs) the other two were pretty good and i was like man this is a whole to do and i was chatting with the the true strike podcast guys and it was like man it'd be really cool if we got to walk out of here with the player's handbook and they're like yeah that that, that would be pretty cool we were just kind of like is it gonna happen is it gonna happen and then like at the very end of their presentation before q a they were like and I want you all to know, you'll be able to experience these changes yourself because you're all going to walk out with them. <laughs> Fucking hell yeah! <laughs> I was so pumped. But yeah, it was it was a fun event. I, I would thank Wizards of the Coast for bringing us out. We talk a lot of shit. We do. We talk an awful lot of shit. Uh, but the boots on the ground people give a shit. And that's what matters. Mm-hmm. Like Jess, who is one of their um, accounts people that does a lot of like marketing and PR and stuff like she gets it. She's played D and D since like the (laughs) eighties. Jeremy Crawford gets it. Chris Perkins gets it. Yeah. The, the, they had the lead artist for the D and D book because they designed all of the art in tandem with the features of the book. Like they care. They, yeah. And when you go to those events, you can tell that they care regardless of what Hasbro is doing, regardless of what their president is doing. They give a shit. That's I think what really matters. Hell yeah. Moving on, though. <laughs> Magic the Gathering. The other arm. The other arm. Mystery Boosters 2. So, I didn't pull up this link. I'm going to pull up the link now. What's in Mystery Boosters 2? No one knows. No one knows. It's no a idea. mystery. It is completely. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> so, mis- I think a good primer would be Mystery Boosters 1. Yes. Which was like a, a convention exclusive thing that they wanted to do. Uh, you would open it up and it was reprints from across Magic's history. A lot of fun stuff. Uh, they brought in the future site frame, I believe, for the first time, or was that Time Spiral? Uh, I believe Time Spiral. Was it Time Spiral time Remaster? S- okay. Yes. Or, or original Time Spiral. I don't know. One of those <laughs> brought the future site frame, but then uh, Mystery Boosters 1 also had it? 
Uh, no, I don't believe so. Do they not? Mystery Boosters 2 definitely does. Yes. I know that. Uh, but they brought in the playtest card, which was like really weird mechanics that they would probably never print on an actual card. Probably. Probably. But. But you were able to play with them. You could get really crazy things like the Slivdrazi Overlord, which was a sliver and an Eldrazi all in one. And it combined sliver features onto Eldrazi and Eldrazi features onto slivers. And it's horrifying abomination. That's great. And then joke cards as well that yeah. are just kind of silly and very fun. So Mystery Boosters 2 was very, very, or Mystery Boosters 1 was very, very popular. You could get convention exclusive packs that had the playtest cards. And then a little while later, they released retail versions where you could get them without the playtest cards. Mm -hmm. And it's just a whole lot of reprints. Uh, Gen Con, Gavin Verhey at his AMA panel announced Mystery Boosters 2. And he kind of went a little bit rogue with it because like, they were planning on doing some of the Mystery Booster 2 stuff at Gen Con as a surprise, but they weren't planning on announcing it at that panel until someone asked about Mystery Boosters. And he's like, I'm just going to say it. <laughs> and announced Mystery Boosters 2. So, in a pack of Mystery Boosters 2, which you'll be able to get for the first time at uh, Metricon Las Vegas, the convention. Not at retail's. Yeah. Not at retail. We'll get into that. You'll be reliably able to get them, as opposed to Gen Con, where uh, it was a surprise. It was a surprise. And he was handing out random packs to random people, and obviously did a Mystery Booster 2 draft with the creators. Yeah, that were there, creators, you know? yeah. Like uh, 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 Josh Lee Kwai and all that kind of Josh, stuff. Josh, Jimmy, uh, Louis Rachel, Stardust. Rachel Weeks. Uh, yeah, ben, ba uh, ben Bateman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of creators were there. They did a Mystery Booster 2 draft, and they were singing the praises of it. Mm-hmm. In a pack of Mystery Boosters 2, you're going to get 15 cards. Like a regular pack. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And there's wow. better value in this one than the fucking value packs, I can tell you that much. Uh, 10 commons and uncommons, you get two of each color. So two white, two black, two blue, two red, two green. Specifically. So they're kind of organized in that yeah. way, which I think is pretty nice. Uh, one multicolor artifact or common, common or uncommon land. So you get a special land, an artifact, or a multicolor card. You get one rare or mythic. One future sight frame frame card, sixty percent, sixty six zero yeah. of the future sight cards are going to be rare or mythic, which is fucking sweet. So oh, you're basically, yeah. you're not guaranteed two rares or two mythics, but you're way more likely to get multiple rares and mythics. Um, five percent of those are going to be foil as well. A little bit less than five percent. Less than one percent of them are replaced with a traditional foil acorn alchemy card. We'll get into that. We'll get into that a little bit later. You get one white bordered card where they're taking a bunch of cards and reprinting them in a white border for the first time. A lot of them are rares and mythics as well. And then you get a playtest card alongside it. Playtest cards are very fun. Yes. Um, pack distribution seems very reasonable. It's interesting that they're choosing to do specifically color allocation for commons and uncommons, like specifically spreading them out, which I... I mean, that's the way the... Mystery Booster 1 did it as well. They did that? Yeah. I bought one Mystery Booster and opened it. I we have a couple in a box there. Yeah, we have a couple. Sorry. T Sorry, Typical. Let's go. Oh, yeah. Typical. We're going to open your pack. <laughs> no. But yeah, that's the way they did it prior. Wow. Yeah. Words are hard. Yes. So these are very popular packs in the regular Mystery Booster conventions. Yes. Um, all of them are going to be reprints, except for the playtest cards. Those are brand new. <laughs> but... All of the other cards are reprints either in New Frame, in the Future Sight, uh, and then all the ones that are just normal reprints have the set symbol from the set that they were originally from, and then they have the Planeswalker icon in the bottom, much like list cards do yep. to designate them as different from the original printing. Um, let's see. Playtest cards re return. 15 Future Sight cards are only available in foil, which is interesting. Don't know why they chose to do that, but who knows? Pretty cool, nonetheless. Uh, we're getting a lot of cool future sight cards, like command towers, soul rings, uh, cards that have never seen future sight frames. Before. Yeah, the future sight frames are one of the most unique frames in all of Magic. The whole the whole vibe is from is like here's the future sight frame was originally for cards printed in Time Spiral, mm -hmm. and it was like here's a vision of a creature in the future that doesn't exist yet in the in the magic lore and it would be like a weird creature yeah and now we're getting future sight frames of all of these other cards some of them creatures that are being reprinted very powerful cards lots of very powerful reprints yeah. as well um you i believe you can get a mana crypt from this 
I, I don't know. You can get Urza Saga in White Border. You can get Basalt Monolith, I know. Uh, Cloudstone Curio. A lot of very expensive, very powerful reprints in this set. Uh, Playtest cards are non-eternal legal cards. So they're not eternal legal. Sorry. Uh, you can play them basically in a draft format or as rule zero in Commander decks and stuff. And that's kind of it. Uh, which is fine. They're still very fun. Uh, they do have new Eternal Legal cards. Specifically, uh, they called out the Mardu Outrider and Goblin Gang Leader, which are from the Magic the Gathering Arena's beginner set. So this is their first physical printing and their Arena exclusive cards until now. Until now. Uh, they don't have Arena exclusive mechanics like the Conjure mechanic, which we'll get into later. Uh, so they are able to be played in a normal paper format. Yes. Uh, they also called out the Valken Dragon, which existed for 20 years in the Magic Online database and is getting its first ever paper printing. Yeah. So the, the I believe they I, I was watching the Loading Ready Run uh, podcast, and they were talking about this as well. Apparently, there are 10 of these cards that came from, I believe it was the dreamcast magic the gathering yes. game yes 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 and um, they br- eventually brought over to magic online mm-hmm. uh but now we're getting the first ever print because yeah dreamcast had a magic the gathering game and had exclusive cards in it it's like what <laughs> i mean we like china had exclusive <laughs> magic the gathering cards for a while too and they've slowly been reprinting yeah. those over time all right Back to the alchemy acorn cards that you might be able to get in your future site slot in yes. the pack. Acorn cards, of course, being the replacement for Silver Border as of yes. Unfinity last year. Yes. So in the bottom of Magic Cards, you have the little... Okay, that's an alt art, so that doesn't help. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't help. That's also an alt art. Okay, this one. Okay, that's a land. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> well, you're a <competitor. laughs> All right. In the bottom, there's the little oval of foil uh, that is one of the, like, protections against... It's a holographic uh, stamp, basically. Yeah, it's a forgery protection. Jesus Christ. That's not avail- That's not on every card, apparently. <laughs> but uh, these cards are going to have an acorn there to designate them as not at all legal at all in basically anything. Yeah. Because there are seven previously digitally only cards that have digital only mechanics from Magic the Gathering Arenas. So a card like Torolf's Discipline, uh, which I believe is a sorcery that has the Conjure keyword, which is an arena exclusive keyword. Conjure effectively, you create four car like in, in the case of Torolf's Discipline, you create four copies of Lightning Bolt yeah. and you shuffle those into your library. So your library hat now is saturated with more lightning bolts. Mm -hmm. Or the way more popular one, Oracle of the Alpha, which is this bird creature. When it enters, you conjure the power nine and shuffle them into your deck. So all the Moxes, Ancestral Recall, Black Lotus, all of that, those cards come into existence and then get shuffled into your library. A mechanic that you really can't replicate in paper. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, obviously, we have uh, the mechanic of creating tokens, oftentimes tokens of uh, of previous cards, such as um, Garth One-Eye can create a Black Lotus. But he creates it on the stack, and you don't actually yes. need a Black Lotus card. No. You basically you just need a token to represent that card. Yep. Uh, and you're able to cast it that turn. So that And that's one of those rare exceptions to the Magic the Gathering rule, and that Garth One Eye was specifically designed to kind of be that. Yeah. These literally cannot work in paper. Nope. Because they require shuffling into your library, and they are not tokens. Toros Discipline creates... Four lightning bolts. Yes. The card lightning bolt and shuffles it into your library. Um, those are going to be really weird in a draft setting <laughs> if someone pulls one of them. Uh, the other one that they called out is Sanguine Brushstroke. Uh, there's going to be four others. I don't, remember, I don't remember what Sanguine Brushstroke does, but it has more arena exclusive mechanics that you can't replicate in paper mm-hmm. easily. Uh, but they're going to be very, very fun collector cards. And there's going to be people that are going to create proxies of the Power Nine and are going to be like, hey, can I play this deck that has Oracle of the Alpha in it? And I've got the same sleeves with these proxies of the Power Nine in them. If I cast it, good luck. Yeah. (laughs) So very fun stuff. Um, The White Border reprint slot is going to be the first White Border printing for all of the cards in that slot. We've seen Urza's Saga, um, Ponder, 
Uro, Titan of Nature. Yeah, and there's going to be a lot of powerful cards in that slot as well. Which, uh, a lot of people like White Border. It's like come back around now. Uh, uh, apparently, uh, uh, when when y'all were checking this out on Twitter, uh, we saw that there is an entire format that's just White Border only cards. And they haven't gotten anything in a long time. In a long time. And so it's like, oh. They now get Urza suddenly, Saga. <laughs> suddenly they now have stuff. I will say some of the white border cards look a little weird. Oh, yeah. like Or like like the legendary Uro. Uh, Cabal Coffers <laughs> in yeah. white border is very weird. It's the, it's the continuing trend of the weird alternate arts and borders that make it very hard to tell at a glance what the color of the fucking card is. <laughs> That's true. The, the I think of Vein Ripper regularly because I pulled the um, the case art oh, that's yeah. all white paper and then it's uh, black, black, mana pips. And I'm like, okay, well, this doesn't look like a black card at all. No, <laughs> it doesn't. And so like, oh, this beautiful, clean white border for the Cabal Coffers that generates a lot of black mana is just like a weird vibe to yeah. me personally uh, all right over a thousand reprints from across magic history uh some of these reprints have updated their rules text and typesetting to better fit with modern magic so keywords that didn't really exist prior like vigilance uh some old cards are being reprinted where it was later, when this creature attacks you do not have to tap to attack it with mm -hmm. it now that's all just being taken out and replaced with vigilance. A lot of these, with the oracle text, yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of those are reflective of what they've been doing on Magic Online for a while now, mm -hmm. and updating these older cards to have proper oracle text on them, which is just a nice feature. Some of them, though, as you pointed out, are going to keep the old rules text because it's cool. Yeah, um, I believe it's like Soltari Soldier or something like that. Use that's the one I saw. It had. You know the we the modern phrasing is for triggered abilities. It says when this happens. So in that case, in the case of the uh, Soltari Soldier, I think it's when uh, you know the modern would be when this creature attacks, it gets plus one plus one until end of turn. Mm -hmm. um, in the, I believe that it was originally printed in Tempest, and it had it, shadow. Not that one. Uh, it's oh, it's Soltari. something Soltari something. Soltari Gorillas. Mm. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, we tried. <laughs> we tried. So that would be the modern. The, the original is, if this creature attacks this turn, it gets plus one, plus one. Mm -hmm. Effectively, same thing. And, of course, the rules, you know, the comprehensive rules say triggered abilities are if, when, whenever. It's but we just, don't use if now, really. Yeah. We yeah. use when. Yeah. Uh, so that's just, like, a fun thing. Um, all other reprints without the future sight frame, acorn stamp, or the white border have the planeswalker stamp, like the list. Uh, to differentiate from the original printings. And uh, some cards that were originally only printed in foil in previous sets are now getting non-foil printings as well. Uh, you are able to look through the entire full set of cards that are being reprinted. It is a massive list. We are not going to go through it because it is so unreasonably huge mm -hmm. that it would take its entire podcast effectively. We might have on typical to talk about Mystery Booster 2 for all we know. Who knows? Some of the fun fun cards that are in there. Oh, so fun. Also, I looked it up. It's Soltari Trooper. Soltari Trooper. Okay, well, now I want to. Soltari Trooper. Uh, Tempest Remastered was the original. Let's go to Card Kingdom here. Shadow. If Soltari Trooper attacks, it gets plus one, plus one until end turn. Okay. That's a good looking card. I like that. Art. It's a cool looking card. Yeah. Okay, cool. Anyway. So, the Soltari is one of, those, uh, one of those types that just... It was around for a while, and and now you never yeah. like Kithkin. Kithkin oh, yeah. being replaced by Hobbit, though, mm -hmm. or Halfling. 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 Uh, they did have the Kithkin Billy Rider in. It's, it was like a single callback in the March of the Machines. Yeah, that's right. Which I love that they do like one random one-off cards like that too. Anyway. So that's if you're able to go to a convention. <laughs> All of that is if you are able to go to a convention and get a Mystery Booster 2 pack, which is the only place that you're going to get it. It is not going to have a retail release. But <laughs> there is a product that you will be able to get in less than a week if you're listening to this on free feeds uh, on August 19th. Actually, the day this comes out. Hell yeah. Oh, God. On free feeds. On free feeds. If you want it early, you should go sub over at the Patreon for $5 a month. Anyway. Festival in a Box, Las Vegas 2024. 
If you go to the Secret Lair website, it's going to go live on August 19th. Limited quantity. So secret new modern Secret Lair rules. They are not print to demand. They are limited stock. Limiting to three of these per person. Which is a lot. <laughs> it's almost a thousand dollars. Yeah. Two hundred and forty nine ninety nine. You get an entire Mystery Booster 2 display box of 24 packs. For reference, Mystery Booster 1 retail versions, because they did get a retail release, you can buy on TCG Player for around $250 right now. So, the same price. Mm -hmm. In Festival in a Box, you also get a Lost Caverns of Ixalan Collector Booster, which retails for about $38. A Wilds of Eldraine Collector Booster, which retails for about $33. A Commander Masters Collector Booster, which retails for a whopping $63 right now. A lot of good reprints. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you also get one <laughs> Lil Legends Foil Edition Secret Lair Drop in traditional foil. Uh, so they're like little chibi art versions of Araya Dawnbringer, Orvar the All Form, Drena the Last Blood Chief, Lavinia, Azorius Renegade, and Omnath Lo Locus of Creation. You also get one Magicon non foil promo pack, which includes new arts for Ponder, Swords to Plowshares, a Convention Morrow playtest card, and a planes. A cool. full art planes. The full art planes looks really cool because it's got a bunch of like lotuses floating around and it looks really pretty. Objectively speaking, $250 for Mystery Boosters 2 display box, three collector boosters, a foil secret lair, and a pack of four promo cards that are exclusive to a convention is a dynamite deal. Mm -hmm. A stupid good deal. But. And here's the big but about Mystery Boosters 2. Mystery Boosters 2 is going to be awesome. It will be. So, so, so cool. And chances are, if you're listening to this, you will never be able to play with Mystery Boosters 2. Sorry there, friend. Unless you pay a lot of money on the secondary market. Yeah. Festival in a Box Las Vegas 2024 is going to be how most people are able to get it. It is a limited quantity, secret lair style release. So it's going to sell out probably in 10 minutes. On August 19th when it goes live. Yeah. And people are going to be buying three copies of it for $750. And immediately are going to be flipping those boxes on eBay for $500 apiece. It's going to be entirely luck-based if you manage to get the festival in a box. If you get it, you're getting a fantastic value. Congratulations. All things considered, fantastic value. But because it is limited quantity it just sours this whole experience people are already kind of upset that it's not getting a retail release though i imagine in the future they're going to do these they're going to do these festival in a boxes for mm -hmm. a couple of conventions and they're going to make a boatload of money off of it and the secondary market's going to be way inflated with these cards and in like a year or two they're going to do a retail version like they did with mystery boosters one that doesn't have the play test cards is what i suspect will happen yeah probably it sucks because Mystery Boosters 2 is probably one of the coolest things that Magic has released in a long time. Yeah. This sucks. It's very interesting that it's, to me this festival in a, festival in a box. Because um, this year definitely the focus is on that Mystery Booster 2. If you look at the 2023 Las Vegas Festival in a Box, that was a Mystery Booster and then a bunch of draft boosters. Obviously, no longer have draft boosters. Mm hmm but it definitely, last year it felt like the, the, the list looked like, here you go, have a chaos draft now. This year it looks like, go ahead, try to make your money back. Pretty much. Now, in terms of objective value, it's there. Mm -hmm. Just period. You're, you're going to be able to do like a fun, I think you could do a fun expensive draft. Lost Caverns of Ixalan, Wilds of Eldraine, Commander Masters. Uh, and you could throw in Mystery Boosters too. You can do what is that? Four. You can do one single draft for with twenty four packs. If you had full eight people, yep. three three cards per or three packs per person, you could do a single eight person draft with a Mystery Boosters two box. Um, draft probably the most fun way to play with Mystery Boosters two if you're not just trying to crack the cards and flip them. Yeah, this is a scalper's dream. It is. If a scalper is able to get their hands on three copies of this, they're basically guaranteed to get their money back 
just on flip it on flipping the known quantity price point things the collector packs and then the mystery booster too i bet one of those mystery booster boxes could cover most all of the 750 dollars investment oh yeah and then they're able to open up the rest and a la carte sell the best things or keep them and it sucks yeah it sours the entire experience and frankly i'm not fond of it i'm not either now am i going to try and get the festival in a box las vegas 2024 to be determined (laughs) to be determined but kind of want to i kind of want to i kind of want to go for it i kind of want to go for it and if i get my hands on one i can't buy three i really i can't i can't do that investment right now no no i don't have that kind of liquid asset but 250 Uh, liquid ass hey Hey. i might even i might even be like hey sam you want to throw me like 60 bucks and i'll give you a good chunk of these packs hey typical gemini you want to throw me 60 bucks and then you can have a third of these packs (laughs) you know we'll have to and then and then we can have one or two for the chaos draft that we're going to do at the end of the year which is very exciting we have a pack of every of everything that's happened in yeah. the year, which is very fun. Except the collector boosters for Fallout, because fuck that, those are expensive. Yeah. But that would be a fun thing to do. Um, I don't know if I even want to go for it, honestly, just on principle alone. Though. You know, but... The value is very tempting. Mystery Boosters 2 is awesome. If you are able to go to a Magic Con or any convention where these are being sold, like, pick up a box, pick up some packs, like, it's going to be fake. It's going to be freaking great. It's going to be fun. It's going to be exciting. The value is there. Feel free to mail us some. Yeah, please do, actually. <laughs> I, I would emphatically do that. We need to hit up Lincoln and see what conventions he's going to, and if any of them have Mystery Booster 2, and see if he'll hook us up. Yeah. Send him some dollars. He's got, he knows people. Yeah. I also know people. I know you. That doesn't help you at all. I know Lincoln. That vaguely helps me. Friend of a friend, six degrees of Mystery Booster. Two degrees of Mystery Booster. Six degrees of Kevin Bacon. Hey. Anyway. Shall we move on to the wrap up? <sighs> yeah, we'll wrap it up. We'll wrap it up. Oh, wait, no. Oh, no. Oh. We got a question. Oh. Patreon.com slash the Dungeon Bros. We have a question thread that goes up every week. Brandon asks, thoughts on mystery boosters? <laughs> Worth it or just another way for Watsy to get money? Is it a scam? Mystery boosters, too. I mean, overall, is it still gambling? Yes. Is it still a way for Watsy to... Uh, to get money out of us? Yes. But that's also their business model. That that is their that is the entire business model. I do not think Mystery Boosters 2 is a scam or a cash grab. Straight up. Mm-hmm. I think Festival in a Box is a straight up cash grab. Yeah. They're trying to offload collector boosters for sets that aren't selling. Um People aren't getting Commander Masters collector boosters because they're massively inflated in price. And while there are valuable reprints, the distribution of those reprints is not very favorable. Wilds of Eldraine, you have a great bonus sheet. Lost Caverns of Ixalan, you have a great bonus sheet. But they're bonus sheets. And they're packs that came out a year over... the All these packs came out last year. Yeah. So they're, I, I think they're offloading some of the more valuable things to try and get rid of the perspective that people had of the previous festival in the box of just getting rid of a bunch of draft packs they had lying around. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the se- the Lil Legend Secret Lair probably is not going to sell or hasn't. S- Has that come out yet? The Lil Legends? Uh, I don't know. The Foil Edition, I imagine, not going to go very well. Uh, Secret Lairs are already kind of in a weird spot. You're going to have your Monty Python and the Holy Grail ones that are going to sell out immediately. Mm-hmm. But even right now, Secret Lairs, there's a ton that are still available. Oh, yeah? And they're probably not going to hit the print allocation that they had for them in the first place. Uh, and then you're going to have Monty Python, and it's going to sell out in 10 minutes. Yeah. So It do be like that. Yeah. Uh, do I think it is a cash grab? No. no. Festival in a box. A little bit. A little bit. They're, they're trying to do the FOMO thing with Secret Lair style yeah. release. And I imagine they're going to do that a couple more times. And eventually they're going to have a retail version. You know what sucks about it is, like, the, I, I hate that it's manufactured FOMO. I really like the idea of 
and unfortunately I just the way the world works is these days it's not as cool is that idea of I was here at the right place at the right time and I got something cool yeah and I can I can share it I can talk about it I can I can sell it if I want to but unfortunately nowadays it's like because of be, you know be, there's uh, there's a lot of negativity around the FOMO about well, I can't go to a convention, or I don't feel comfortable going to a convention for whatever reason, so I'm never going to be able to get this, and yeah. so I need this. It's like, I get it. I, I get the disappointment in, in, in that manner, but man, I I yearn for a day that I don't think I was ever a part of, <laughs> of I was in the right place, at yeah. the right time, and I got to drink that you know, sweet, sweet mystery booster. <laughs> sweet, sweet mystery booster. We were almost that this, this last weekend at Gen Con. Missed it by that much. Just a bit. Because Gavin was like dressed up like Secret Service style with a briefcase and was literally walking around the Magic the Gathering hall and just going up to people and giving them packs, Mm -hmm. which was awesome. And we just didn't happen to be there. Yeah. Which sucked. But you can't guarantee that sort of thing. I'm excited for Mystery Roosters too. If we go to SCG Con, we go to Next Gen Con and they're there, like I'm definitely going to pick up packs. Yeah. Because it's going to be fun. At the very least. Maybe not make your money's worth, but it's going to be cool and fun. And that's what this game is. Festival in a box? To be determined. To be determined. But wrap-up time. We've got only one wrap-up thing, because there's two fairly juicy topics, and we kind of glossed over all the D&D stuff just because it's... I feel like it might be getting repetitive. We've, we've said all the stats on it multiple times. We'll say them again. Got same, it. I'll, I'll keep saying them. You can't stop me. You won't. 364 pages. 84 pages. 384 pages for the player's handbook. Anyway, uh, D&D and Magic are crossing over yet again. Yet again. Secret Lair D&D 50th anniversary. So we're getting a Secret Lair drop of Magic cards that have old and modern D&D art with them. Yeah. For example, we have Fell the Mighty, which is four and a white for a sorcery. Destroy all creatures with power greater than target creatures' power. And it has the art of a very old fighter from, like, original D&D and the original art for the Beholder, which is a golf ball with little baby tentacle hairs on it. Yeah, Dungeons & Dragons Supplement E, Greyhawk 1975. Yeah. Yes. Oh, my gosh. For one, the old original Beholder art is so fucking funny. It's hilarious. I love it endlessly. The other one, my favorite one in terms of look, is Faithless Looting. One single red for a sorcery. You draw two cards and discard two cards. It's got flashback for two and a red. It is from a D&D Player's Handbook, the cover from 1978. Yeah. And it is beautiful. It's, the, I think, one of the most iconic visuals mm-hmm. ever. That and... Uh, nope, not that one. Not that one. Didn't they have the DMG cover for one of these? Where is it? Uh, the oh, yeah. The, oh, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> I'm just clicking around at this point. The next one. This is the one card of significant value yeah. in this in this secret layer. We'll get into a value breakdown here after this. Goldspan Dragon, three red red for a 4-4 four, four creature dragon. Flying in haste, whenever it attacks and beca- or becomes the target of a spell, you create a treasure token. And treasures you control have tap, sack this treasure, artif- or sorry, tap, sack this artifact at two mana of any color. So it doubles your two treasures. Mana. And it creates treasures. Uh, this is from the Dra- uh, Dungeons and Dragons set one basic rules red box from 1983. And it's the dragon. He's got his fangs up in the soldiers like slashing across which is pretty cool uh we also get reality shift one in a blue for an instant exile target creature its controller manifests the top card of its library the art is from advanced dungeons and dragons the dungeon master's guide second edition from 1989 monster manual uh from from the forgotten realms set uh three and a green for an artifact it's got a uh, adventure sorcery zoological study for two and a green where you mill five cards return a creature card mill this way to your hand and it's got uh the artifact side which has one and a green tap you may put a creature card from your hand onto the battlefield this is from the third edition monster manual in 2000 straight up straight up 2000 y2k baby uh ponder Single blue mana for a sorcery. You look at the top three cards of your library, put them back in any order. You may shuffle your library and then draw a card. This is the Dungeon Master's Guide, fourth edition from 2008. And lastly, Aserac the Arch Lich. Two and a black. This is from the uh, Forgotten Realm set. Legendary creature, Zombie Wizards, 5-5. Five, five. When it enters, if you haven't completed the Tomb of Annihilation, you return it to your hand uh, and venture into the dungeon. 
whenever uh, Asarak attacks, for each opponent, you create a 2-2 black zombie creature token unless that player sacrifices a creature. And that is the 5th edition original, 2014, 5th edition Dungeon Master's Guide cover featuring Azarak. Yeah. Which is pretty cool. Uh, all said and told, we looked up the cheapest versions of these cards on TCG Player right before we recorded. You're looking at about $20 in value on the cards. Yeah. And the foil edition secret layers, $39.99. Non-foil versions, $29.99. Yeah. You're going to get some... Pretty good reprints. You got Ponder, Faithless Looting. Pretty much everyone uses those in those colors. Goldspan Dragon's a big hit. Asarak, it's got some fun combo potential, but it's very niche. Uh, Fell the Mighty, not very useful. Um, The cards are very, very cool and thematic. Um, Reality Shift, it's it's a fine blue removal spell. You don't have a lot of exile effects in blue. Uh, the monster manual not really useful. <laughs> um, secret layers, generally, not going to be buying them for the value. No, oftentimes the cards do get to be more valuable because they are unique art. There aren't as many of them, but especially in this case, I don't think they, there's. You know, you're going to be buying it because this is cool. Yeah, you with all the secret layers, the reprint value lately. Ever since they've done the the FOMO method, yeah, has uh, value hasn't really been there in terms of reprint value. That being said, Ponder has been in several secret layers, yeah, and other secret layer versions of Ponder instead of going for thirty cents, go for like ten dollars. Yeah, so literally, if you get a secret layer, that specific printing of that card is going to hold value. Whether or not it is able to sell at Mm -hmm. that value is another question entirely, if you even want to do that. Uh, That being said, I think that's a fun way of celebrating D&D's 50th anniversary. I do too. Um, Which we didn't even bring up. One of the coolest parts of Gen Con was the D&D museum they had. That's right, yeah. Uh, There was an entire section on the second floor and they had these glass cases where they set up all of the books and play accessories and a a bunch of fun stuff from Every edition of D&D going way back to, like, the first ever Gen Con, basically. Yeah. And that whole museum was really, really cool. And it's giving the same vibe in the secret layer, for sure. It's giving 50 years of D&D. Yeah. It is giving 50 years of D&D. You gonna pick it up? Probably not. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I might. That beholder's kind of (laughs) cute. I want to know what that mouth do. Oh, God. Anyway. That is all we have... In the news today, we've already answered Brandon's question from the Patreon, patreon.com slash the Dungeon Bros. You can join for $5 a month. You can also join for free. For free. For free. And you can ask questions. Uh, we also will now turn to the TikTok live chat. Is there anything? Nope. Not anything. Literally nothing. God. God damn. Mm-mm-mm. Mm-mm-mm-mm. Mm-mm. Man, TikTok's not fun. <laughs> <laughs> not as fun as it once was. It ain't as good as it once was. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. But that is all we have now for episode 73 of the Duels and Manadors podcast. The last time in this room yeah. we record the podcast with our valuable cards framed, the Lord of the Rings lands, because we haven't swapped out for the full art lands of any other set. This weird stick thing that somebody sent us and we we hyped. It is cool. Oh, yeah. It's a cool little it's a cool little gadget. It's cool a little a collectible. It's a cool little collectible. I don't know if it's actually collectible. Uh, the 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 D twenty staff of critical hits. It's pretty neat. We have disc plate. We do have disc plate. Not sponsored. And dat plate. And dat plate. I don't think you can see that one. I don't know if you can see that one. But yeah. <sighs> End of an era. End of an era. The next time you see us on. Carefully, there's a there's a table there. Actually, hit the token box. Oh, the token box. My my vault of tokens. Interesting. Hmm. <laughs> This is the last time we will record in person. Yeah. At this table. And uh, the next time you'll be seeing us, it'll be digitally, virtually, on Riverside. Might be better. Who knows? It's going to be more convenient. Absolutely. <laughs> Way more convenient. Uh, but yeah, it's been fun. We love you very much, and as always, 